Hi everyone, welcome back to my channel H E Live. I'm Dr. Cindy Wong, and today I am going to pick up where I left off quite a while back, actually. Last time I talked about common diagnoses in the stomach, and this time I'll talk about common diagnoses in the small bowel. And honestly, for most of the diagnoses in the small bowel, most of them are made within the duodenum. So the ones I'll talk about today will be peptic duodenitis, duodenal adenoma, and celiac disease. Let's get started with this first image. So on low power to me, this overall looks more blue than I would normally expect for a healthy looking small bowel. When we zoom in, we can see that there are these submucosal glands and these are the Brunner's glands. And when you have Brunner's glands in the small bowel, you are in the duodenum. So without anyone telling you, just looking at this, you know you are in the duodenum. And then when you are looking around, you can see that the surface mucosa is lacking the goblet cells. Here is one goblet cell, but most of this mucosa is lacking goblet cells and it looks very blue, very busy. So here we have the submucosal Brunner's glands and then on the surface mucosa, we see that there is lack of goblet cells, which is normal intestinal mucosa of the small bowel. You have these uh, surface very pink apical mucin, which is characteristic of seeing in the stomach. So this is considered foveolar metaplasia. So this is basically saying that there has been some sort of injury occurring to this mucosa, as you can see here, and this injury resulted in the normal uh, intestinal type mucosa to this foveolar type epithelium, which is better to withstand this sort of injury that the current mucosa is undergoing. And uh, by looking at this and looking at what else is making this busy is here's more foveolar metaplasia. And then here you can start to see neutrophils. Let's go in a little closer. These are the ants infiltrating into the surface epithelium. Here are some neutrophils, more neutrophils. So, and then you can also see neutrophils here. So overall, if we look at this, the diagnosis would be active duodenitis with foveolar metaplasia. And a very common cause for something like this is increased stomach acid exposure to the duodenum. And this is more likely to happen in the proximal duodenum. And the things that may cause this might be H. pylori in the stomach, and you have this backlash of increased acid production. And the acid production basically is not very kind to intestinal time epithelium. So to protect itself, the intestinal type epithelium starts to change into foveolar type epithelium, which is the lining of the stomach, which is more resistant to gastric contents. So that is the cause of this. Other causes you can see for active duodenitis could be medication and also infection. When you don't have the neutrophils, it would just be considered duodenal epithelium with foveolar metaplasia. Okay, so that is this case. It's a really cute case. Let's move on to our next one. So our next one is something that a lot of endoscopists ask us to look for. So let's on low power, we can see that we have the submucosal Brunner's glands. Once again, we are in the duodenum. And once again, I think overall on low power, my first impression is that the lamina propria is very busy. When I mean by very busy, it's kind of filled with inflammatory cells, mostly lymphocytes and plasma cells. And when you think about it, like having plasma cells and lymphocytes and the occasional EO in your lamina propria of the small bowel, I've mentioned says this completely normal and it's okay, but I guess this is kind of more where the more experience you have, the more gestalt you have. And to me, when I look at this, I feel like there's just a little too much in the lamina propria. And then at the same time, if I go closer, there's a little too much in the surface epithelium. Look at this villi. This villi is still long and slender, but however, within this villi, it's just filled with lymphocytes. So that's a lymphocyte, this is a lymphocyte, 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 blah, blah, there, 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 there. It's just, it's just a ton. And when you have all these lymphocytes, it's called increased intraepithelial lymphocytes. And when you have increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, the thing in your head that always go ding, ding, ding is celiac disease. So when I was mentioning that endoscopists send these specimens often, as you'll see, there'll be a lot of duodenal biopsies and they'll be asking you, please look for celiac disease. And most of the time you're not going to see anything and you're just going to be like, whatever, this looks normal. 
But there are times where you'll see increased IELs, and then this is a piece. Let me turn it so it looks to the surface. So here is the submucosa. Here's the mucosa. Unlike the other piece I showed you, you also have to increase IELs, but the villi are no longer long and slender. They're short and stubby. Uh, so when you see these short stubby with villus blunting and the fact that you can still sort of see some villi, you could say this is uh, here mild villus blunting, this is more flat and moderate villus blunting. So this overall could be mild to moderate villus blunting and increased IELs. And when you write the report, it's going to be uh, your top line diagnosis is not going to be celiac disease. Celiac disease is something that is a clinical diagnosis. Your top line will be increased intraepithelial lymphocytes with whatever amount of villus blunting. And th then you'll probably write a C comment. And you'll probably want to mention something along the lines of please correlate with serology because you want to make sure they have celiac disease serology. And then you could also mention that in the proper clinical setting, these features are consistent with celiac disease. And that will be in a comment. Celiac disease, once again, do not write on your top liner. That is something that is made clinically. And all we can tell them is that, yes, we see intraepithelial lymphocytes. Yes, we see villus blunting. And yes, we see increased lymphoplasmic lamina propria inflammation as well. And all three together is very good for celiac disease. When you're counting increased intraepithelial lymphocytes, there is one caveat. You are not counting in this area. You're not counting in the base of the crypts. However, you must count at the tip. And even, even like in this area is no good. You really want to count in the tip. So for example, if this is flat, right? You could, you could, if here is a crib, you could assume there should have been the villas here and then a crib, and there should have been another villa. So you could count all of this. And then this one, you clearly looked how here is the villus tip and you could see so many. Increased IELs in the villus tip should be greater than six lymphocytes per 20 epithelial cells. And if you ever ask pathologists what they do in counting these things, most of them will probably tell you, I don't count. I look at it, it's increased, and therefore it's increased intraepithelial lymphocytes. And this happens a lot in pathology. The more experience you have, the more gestalt you have towards a case, and it's faster. If you were a PGY1 and you have no idea what is too much, and if you want to use that 6 per 20, then you'll have to go on high power and you'll look at this region. For example, let's start here. This is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So this region has 20 epithelial cells. The epithelial cells are the nuclei with the elongated nuclei. And the lymphocytes are just really dark round cells. And in this 20, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and so on and so forth. Clearly greater than 6 per 20. So yeah, this is increased IELs. But no no pathologist is going to sit there and count that. They're just going to like look at that. It's like, yeah, that's, that's too many. With experience comes, I guess, just faster processing speed. All right, so that is celiac disease. All right, so for our third and last entity in this video would be this thing. So once again, let's look on low power. On low power, we could see that here, we could see some Brunner glands here, some mucosal Brunner glands. So this is, once again, in the duodenum. And once again, at low power, boy, oh boy, is this really dark. It's really dark, but not in the way like before. In this case, it was really dark. It's not the epithelium that's really dark. It is the lamina propria that was really dark. Here, the lamina propria is actually not so dark. It's still kind of pink. But in contrast, the epithelium is super dark. All right, so what is going on here? So this is a really great example of epithelial dysplasia. So basically, you have goblet cells, so intestinal type mucosa, and you have these cells. They're really dark. They're really hyperchromatic. They're starting to elongate, and they're starting to pseudostratify. And this is basically the definition of intestinal type dysplasia. And you see it all the way coming up to the surface. You see how even at the very tip of this villi, you have a nucleus that's enlarged, it's dark, and it's pseudostratified against its peers. So if you just look down here, yes, once again, it's 
dark, it's large, it's elongated. But if this comes to, if it begins to look like normal, then you don't care so much. But in contrast, the same changes are all the way to the surface. That is what we call lack of maturation. And lack of maturation is basically low grade dysplasia. The honestly, the, the easiest top line would be duano adenoma. And that's it for this video. Please stay tuned for my next video, which will be about common diagnosis in the colon. So I hope everyone enjoyed this video. If you enjoy my content, please like and subscribe. And I hope to see everyone next time. Bye.